Kapanas. I am DISA's Director of the Office of Small Business Programs, and today we're going to talk a little bit about how to do business with DISA. Full disclosure, this is actually a condensed version of our DISA 101 Small Business Orientation, and if you like what you hear and what you hear coincides with what your business does, uh, feel free to shoot us an email and I'll give you that contact information in the presentation and uh, ask for an invite for the full two hour virtual session that we do every month. So with that being said, we will go ahead and get started um, and feel free to ask questions as you go, whether you wanna put them in the chat or um, just ask as we go. I think we have a nice sized crowd that will allow for that interaction should you want to do that. So today I thought we'll talk a little bit about DISA. We'll talk a little bit about contracting. We'll give you a couple of DISA hints and then we'll talk a little bit about my office and what we do and what we can do for you. The first thing is who, who are we? Um, so DISA is the Defense Information Systems Agency, but we're actually two organized, uh, two organizations that, that complement each other in what our actual missions are. Uh, so DISA is also uh, um, JFHQ Doden, which is in our building as well. Our director uh, for DISA, General Skinner, is also the commander for JFHQ. So on the DISA side of it, our mission is to be a combat support agency where we build, operate, and secure the DISA component of the global enterprise, all the networks that work together to provide the communications uh, for our Department of Defense. And then on the JFHQ Doden side of it, they are actually command and control organizations that its mission is to synchronize the protection um, of that network. And it's important to know not only this, but then how we do contracting so you know where to look for potential opportunities down the road. Um, but more importantly, what, what do we do? Um, you will find that we do anything IT related and anything that is necessary to operate and maintain an agency and the buildings um, and the logistics and support with it. We operate and defend the DOD's network. We've already talked about that. We also support White House Communications, WACA. Uh, we directly support the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Pentagon, our combatant commanders around the world. Uh, we provide enterprise services to the Department of Defense. Uh, we do testing, we do spectrum, we do contracting services for the DOD, and essentially the we have the capability to contract for the majority of the federal contract, uh, the federal agencies. Um, we develop and we test, and we actually have authority to um, uh, sell to foreign militaries. That's a, a unique um, uh, authority that a lot of the agencies do not have. <clears throat> then who do we serve? As you can see, and we talked about the federal government, legislative branch, executive branch. Um, our focus all, obviously is on the Department of Defense. DISA has recently been assigned the, um, to be the executive agent to, to be in charge of all the IT for all of our fourth estate agencies, which are the Department of Defense agencies that are not the Air Force, the Navy, uh, the Marines, um, and the Army. Uh, the rest of us are, are agencies that support those, and since we are the IT agency, they've decided that um, it would be a good idea to streamline all of the IT assets for all of the fourth estate agencies, and that's a pretty big mission that we've taken on. The next part to talk about is where, where do we support? It's very important to understand if you're looking at DISA that we are a worldwide 24-7 operation. 
and how we always like to reiterate this to companies that are new to DISA to ensure that when they're looking at, at RFPs that we have, PWSs, um, potential opportunities to prime contract or subcontract, that you know explicitly where the contract serves, how it serves, and most importantly, where your assets will be required to sit and operate um, their part of the contract because there's a huge price difference whether you're sending somebody to Bahrain or to Korea um, to, or to Pensacola or whether you're going to be sitting at Fort Meade at Scott Air Force Base or from their home. We see more and more these days that a lot of us are working from home as you can probably see in my background this is my house and not my office at Fort Meade. And so the pricing element of how you put together your proposal and also knowing where your assets are and where they can be is super important to how you put your proposal together. And so this, this slide uh, really just shows the different kinds of offices and functions that we have and where they're located. Um, I'll point out in particular the orange one which is labeled as DICO, which is our contracting arm. <clears throat> you can see we have a contingent of contracting folks at Fort Meade. Uh, we have a really big contingent of our uh, contracting folks are 1102s out at DICO Scott. We have those folks out in Hawaii. We have them um, in Europe. We have them in the, the Far East as well. And those are the contracting POCs that you may be dealing with on contractual actions that you have upcoming. More information about DISA uh, related to the contracting side of it is how much money do we spend? Where do we spend it? Um, and for whom do we spend it for? On this slide, you can see um, $1.33 billion of Army money is executed by our DISA contracting folks, almost half a billion for the Air Force, $400 million for the Navy and Marines, and then a large portion of it is for us internally. You can see across the top that last year we spent $6.5 billion in obligations of which that um, will show you our percentages for small business down the road. But you can see that we did seven, over 7,000 new contracts with almost 60,000 actions contractually um, for the year. We support all the services and the 26 defense agencies. Those are the fourth estate folks that I was talking about. And then we support 10 com uh, combatant commands as well. If you're not familiar with DISA, then this is our org chart. If you are familiar with DISA, this is our new org chart. Um, we had a, a large reorganization effective October 1st of 2021, and this is essentially how we fell out. We, we used to be two centers, um, where now we're four. And how we, how we are set up, just so you can see, there's, there's names on these. If you come to the full DISA 101 session, we break down uh, further the four different uh, centers that we have. But you'll see at the top, um, our director, our deputy director, and our assistant to the director all essentially are in charge of the organization. Um, out to the left and right of it, uh, the joint service provider, there are folks at the Pentagon. Um, they used to be a standalone organization and now they, they fall under DISA, they're, they're, part, they're part of DISA now. But those are the traditional folks down at the Pentagon that take care of all the IT stuff for, for the Pentagon. Special staff, that's folks like myself, uh, Office of Small Business Program, all, all the cats and dogs that report directly to the director instead of somewhere else. So we, we report directly to the director um, and, and nobody else. Then on the, um, not sure if you're looking at your, on your left side of it, the mission support, those are organizations that support the entirety of our organization through what their mission is. For instance, the first one, the, the chief financial officer and the comptroller, they handle all the money for all of the DISA programs and all of our 
our external customers that come in. So they're a standalone function. Same with procurement services, which are contracting folks. They, they sit alone in their own entity. And then our workforce services, which is our training and our HR folks. Um, but the in each of those sections have their own contracts for the support that, that they, they do. So we have financial and accounting contracts out of the, the comptroller's office, um, the workforce services development. We have a number of training contracts, a number of IT support contracts, um, a number of logistic contracts. Um, and then when we come down to the bulk of our um, contracts, oh, I forgot about the right side. So when you see the ADCON, the, the, the Joint Artificial Intelligence, Joint Force Headquarters, White House, uh, communication and situation room. Those are folks that are administratively assigned to us for certain functions. The majority of those functions are contracting functions. They do not report to, to DISA or to our director, but we have an MOU and MOA where our, um, our organization, our agency, DISA, has certain things that we will do for them, um, like contracting. And that becomes important later on when we talk about the contracting part of it. And then most importantly, where the overwhelming majority of our contracts and our requirements hit are in the four centers that are below. The Digital Capability and Security Center, the Hosting and Compute Center, the Operation and Infrastructure Center, and our Enterprise um, Enterprise Integration and Innovation Center. I, I laugh because part of the goal of the reorganization was to label things easier to remember and understand. And I still can't memorize all of these. To me, they're just the innovation folks. Uh, but nonetheless, um, each of the centers, we used to have two centers where we had one side that primarily looked at new, new requirements, emerging technologies, new solutions. And then the other side was really um, focused on the operation and sustainment of all of our organizations, our systems and that kind of stuff. And what we found is that we needed to flatten our organization to be more efficient and more effective um, and also consider new, new ways of doing business that, that come into the organization, which include the cloud and how we hold information. And so this is what we ended up with um, and all the areas that fall underneath them. So when you're looking for requirements and what you do to match up with what we do, um, hopefully this has this is the starting point for you to say, oh, well, you know what? I am a very um, uh, entrepreneurial kind of developmental new um, innovative company and we're looking at new solutions. So, you know, you probably want to start and look to see what our enterprise integration and innovation center is doing. Vice, if you're a traditional operations and maintenance and sustainment type of a contractor, then you're going to look more in the operations and um, infrastructure section. So anyway, this is the starting point of our organization. It is on our website. Um, and if, again, if you attend our DISA 101 full session, we'll break down each of these sections a little bit more for you. All right. If you are looking to do business with DISA, it's important to know what our priorities are, what we're doing, and where we're going. And so we've recently published our FY22 to 24 strategic plan. It's available on our website, thisa.mil. Um, and so if you're really interested in it, you should probably read that. Um, it's not that long, it's like eight pages, but it really tips our hat on what's important to us, where we're going and the beginning of a path on how to get there. Um, at the end of this, I'm gonna tell you about an event that, that we're hosting that's virtual um, that we'll talk about, I think we're on the, third line of effort that our director has been hosting um, quarterly uh, virtual sessions where he brings a panel together to talk about each of these lines of effort. So I'm going to tell you how to sign up for that if you want to hear directly from our leadership and our technical experts on each of the lines of effort and why it's important to us, what our, our touch points are, and what we're looking for. Okay, any questions to this point 
on anything we've talked about, about DISA and our mission? No, I don't see any. I'd just like to welcome everybody who's joined us since we started. And just to remind you that you can type out your questions for Carlin in the chat box. Thank you. All right. All right, so we'll now, now we'll move into the, the next section of this, which is about DICO. And so DICO stands for Defense Information Technology Contracting Organization. On our chart, we call them Procurement Services Directorate. I call them contracting. Whatever you want to call them, um, some people still call them by their old name, uh, PLD, Procurement Logistics division, um, but whatever you call them, they are our folks that have the 1102s. Um, they are the ones that have our contracting officers, our contracting specialists, and they're the ones that are in charge of the procurement process and the contracts after they are awarded. Um, what they want to tell you is that they are, uh, their mission is to provide effective and efficient and compliant procurement services for the information technology, telecommunications, and cyber domains in defense of our nation. They do have a web page. Now, I will tell you that this uh, their web page requires you to have PKI to view, um, which also includes a list. Uh, most importantly on that site is the list of our premier contracts, which are our DISA awarded contracts that um, execute a certain function of our, our work. Um, and if you need that information or want that information to look at potential subcontracting opportunities, you can always email us, our office, and, and we can get that list for you. Most importantly on this website is where to find our forecast opportunity, which is uh, currently on our front page of our DISA.mail website. If you open it um, in on a computer screen, it's in the middle. If you if you're opening it on a phone, you just need to scroll down till you see the block that says opportunities. And under that opportunities um, section is two links. One link that goes to our forecast, which was just updated. So it's hot off the press um, for quarter three of FY22. Um, I'm, here's, here's also like a hint and a trick that we posted in PDF and everyone's always like, oh, for the love of God, we can't read this. Can't you publish it in Excel? It'd make it so much easier for us. And because of 508 compliance rules, we can't. However, comma, what I will tell you is if you pull it down as a PDF and then save as an Excel um, spreadsheet, it converts, it converts just fine. Um, that's actually what our office does as well to get it in a PDF because it, I mean, in an Excel, because it is definitely easier to um, utilize in an Excel spreadsheet where you can sort it um, by any column necessary for you. And so that tells you about all the things that we know of that are upcoming. We, we, we guess at what we might think the acquisition strategy is. And generally, just so you know, the acquisition strategy listed on that sheet is generally what the current acquisition strategy is. So if you see that it says it's small business set aside, that means the current one, that generally means the current one is. Um, but what I will tell you is that we don't make the acquisition decisions until after current market research is done on that specific requirement to make a determination um, whether small business can do it. And if we know small business can do it, can one of the subsets of uh, the, the things we can federally designate that are federally designated that we can set aside, woman owned, service disabled, hub zone, 8A. Um, and if we have the opportunity to further set it aside to help us with our targets for our goals or to reduce competition, so we can have an effective, efficient um, evaluation of the proposals to get four instead of 14. Um, and so, so that's, that's that part of it. That's what we know is upcoming. Now, what we've recently done is added a new link on that. The second link in there is the DISA acquisition decisions. That once we make the decision, once we've determined it's gonna be a hub zone set aside and it's gonna be on GSA mass, um, we're now publishing that so everybody can see what those decisions are on a monthly basis. So you know what it is um, because we, 
we do we do a good job of announcing our market research, but what we haven't been really good at is announcing those decisions that we make. So we're hoping that this is a, a, a new way to communicate the decisions that have been made to industry so they know instead of having to guess or always following up on email to find out um, what decision we made. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to that have some slides on are what contract vehicles that we use. So about five years ago, OMB came out with a memo that said, we really want all of the federal agencies to be using existing contracting vehicles that are already out there, that they, they thought that that was that if companies were already vetted and spent a lot of time and money on proposals to win these contracts, then the rest of us should be executing our work through them. And so these just are a list of the vehicles that, that we use. Um, we don't use FAR Part 15 very much anymore. When we do FAR Part 15, it either means that the requirement that we have doesn't fit under any vehicle, but most likely it's because we need to have an IDIQ tool. We need to be able to execute task orders when the different pieces and parts of the work come through. And the GWACs and the schedules don't allow for you to execute an IDIQ. You can't award a task order off of a task order. And so that's when, when DISA utilizes it. Um, I will also tell you that all of our market research um, when we're looking for sources, we'll go on SAM.gov. If we have a source of SOT notice out there, it is a real requirement. We're not trying to do any other research other than on that specific real requirement. Um, but our, our actual solicitations rarely get posted out there. So you'll need to know what vehicle that we're gonna use and how to get access to that solicitation when it drops. But some of our vehicles that we use, and this is from a category management application, which, you know, um, the category management is again, trying to be efficient and using existing tools. And then how, how we're, we're, we at DISA are utilizing that tools for that metric, um, but still meeting our small business goals. And so each of the vehicles now generally have a way to set aside on those so we can still use them. Um, but these are the general tools that we're using. So my whole diatribe on this is really to let you know that if you want to do work with DISA, you're going to have to be on contract vehicles that allow you to propose on our work. Generally, um, GSA Mass is our most popular vehicle that we're executing it on. Um, the STARS-3, now that that's awarded, I would anticipate we will utilize it as much or more than we did STARS-2. The VETS-2 is a vehicle that's really great when we are targeting our SDVOSB category. Um, and then we have two main um, premier vehicles that we executed for us and for the entire Department of Defense to use that are very specific to DISA and the DOD's IT needs that are clauses and how we wrote things up were specific to our mission. And one of those is called Encore 3, where we've been able to designate it as a tier one. So we get the category management category uh, credit, but we also have a small business suite so we can still, still execute it uh, to our, with small business set aside. Now our Encore core vehicle, is one where it's focused on operations, maintenance, and sustainment work. And we have 20 small businesses in that, on that contract and 20 large businesses on it. It is a 10-year contract. It's $17.5 billion worth of capacity. So it is one of our go-to vehicles looking at that kind of work. Um, I will tell you between this and SETI, our systems engineering technology and innovation contract vehicle, multiple award IDIQ, um, the second one that's listed there, that um, that's also a 10-year vehicle. With both of these contracting vehicles, um, we put in subcontracting requirements, uh, not only to execute it, but to report it. And um, so in all those vehicles, both small and large, they have requirements to be subcontracting to all the small business categories. And so while the vehicles have on-ramping, capabilities. It's not likely to have an on-ramp for probably three more years at this point if they, if they end up doing it. 
but that doesn't mean those opportunities aren't available at a subcontracting level. So our office does have a directory that gives you the names of the contractors and their small business point of contacts for subcontracting. And it's on our website or we can email that to you as well. If you sell products, um, uh, we execute a lot of our hardware and software procurements through soup. That's our number one thing. Um, if you have a requirement that's on uh, um, other schedules that we have to purchase from EIS and ESI, one is telecom and one is software, then we will utilize those. Um, but generally these are the list of the, the vehicles that we are using. So then the next question is, what are our NAICS codes? So these, uh, this is from 2021, uh, fiscal year 21, that shows you our top NAICS codes based, uh, based on either the total number of actions or the total dollar values. Uh, not surprising, other computer related services is our number one in dollars. And then uh, DISA, we also have a big mission on the telecom. We do the majority of telecom contracts for the Department of Defense um, with our actions over 35,000 just in that NAICS code alone. Computer design services, satellite telecommunications, um, and software publishers are our highest um, NAICS code utilizations. So if those are things that you do, um, we might be a good fit. If these are not things that you do, then, then DISA might not be an organization uh, that would fit. However, comma, I would also say we do um, a lot of admin support. We all, uh, have janitorial contracts. We have snow removal services. Um, so anything related to the functions of operating buildings would also um, be included, just not as frequently. Okay, so that was our contracting piece. Do we have any contracting questions? Uh, yes, we do have some questions that have come in. Um, so one is, how do we get a PKI? And does the, there's another one that, uh, does the Ident Trust SSL digital certificate support PKI? I'm not sure if you addressed that. I didn't and I don't, I don't know. Um, okay. But if you, if, if whoever had the question, if you email us at our email address here, the DISA small business at mail.mail, I can go find the answer for you. Um, it's, it's not a clearance piece of it. It's just like a validation thing. And, you know, in my past, I know there were different places that you could go and ask for one and you have to prove who you are and stuff. But that was a long time ago. So um, if you send me the email, I will track somebody down in DISA that can provide the answer to that. Okay. And another question is, um, can, we share, can you please share the link where subcontracting is an option? Yes. And it's like the next slide. I will show that to you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Okay. So this next part is just kind of some hints that um, help you Kind of figure out whether we're an agency you should be be targeting. Um, so one of the things that that you know you do um, is you do your homework on an agency before you figure out. Well, oh look, they buy what we sell. Oh look, they my past performance matches what they're doing. And so one of the things that that we always tell folks is to make sure you're doing your homework. So the disa.mil website. Um, I always use the example. When I started this job almost four years ago, I came from contracting. And when I was in contracting, I knew my portfolio, I knew my customers, I knew you know, what I did. But when I came into this job, I now had to know what our entire agency did. And, and I knew one piece of it, and there's a whole lot of what we do. And people would send in emails to the DISA small business at mail.mail email address, and they would just ask all sorts of questions. And I'm like, like the PKI, I don't know. Um, but what I found out in getting the answers for the questions that came in, that the overwhelming majority, like 
80 or 90 percent of the questions that came in, I could find the answer on our website with five or six clicks. And if I can find the answer in five or six clicks, so can anybody else because it's a publicly available website. And I say that because, you know, our office is going to answer the emails and we'll help you out to the extent that, that we can. But to send us an email and wait for an answer, and, and we are faster than most folks on a general email box, but it's generally not instantaneously. And if you need an answer really quickly and you can find it, you can save yourself some time. Um, but what I, my whole point on that is our website really has a lot of information about who we are, what we do, um, and then information about our different programs. So I just recommend folks start there. We have a link on the webpage too that has more specific information on um, small business, including a link to the, um, the DISA uh, study and encore directories that have the information about all those contracts, small and large, and their point of contacts um, on how, who to contact to see if there's a potential partnership that could be had through subcontracting. So that information there, um, events that we're hosting will be on there, and just some general information about doing small business and how to contact us, how to get invited to the DISA 101 small business um, uh, uh, orientations that we have. Then, you know, I think the number one takeaway for the folks here, if you're interested in doing business with DISA, is just that DISA small business at mail.mail. And you can email us any question that you have and we'll, we'll give you the answer or the starting point or, or the direction to head in. Um, but a couple more things, then again, this is coming out of the, the whole version of the DISA 101, is Responding to sources sought notice, um, so how we make the decisions on whether we set something aside or whether we don't or what contract vehicle that we, we put it out is what small businesses are interested, what ones do we know about, and the number one way for us to determine that is who's responding to our sources sought notice, who's giving us the information so we can determine, oh yeah, they could do that, oh my goodness, they've done that, and where we have a comfort on you know, small business easily can do it. And so if you're wanting to do it, if you want to influence how we make that decision, respond to the source of sought notice and provide the information that we ask for. I'm a small business, I'm woman owned, I'm service disabled, and I have the following contract vehicles. And if we get 10 responses and we have 10 service disabled veteran owned businesses that are on vets too, that's really easy to say, oh, well, we're going to get competition of qualified companies and we can hit one of our targets that we're looking for um, for our small business achievement. And they all have the light contract, so they all have an opportunity to propose on it. And we always encourage you guys to talk to your frenemies, the people that have the same designations and the same contracts, and have them all respond to it. Um, and so that's just that's normal. Any small business person is going to tell you that. Um, the second part in red, um, ask for the RFPs. Uh, DISA sometimes posts, like we decide that we're posting, that we're going to, it's going to be a hub zone set aside on GSA Mass. Some of our KOs will actually post it to GSA Mass eBuy, just to the whole list of hub zones. Other of our contracting officers send it out directly to those that responded to the source of sought notice and anybody else who asks for it. Um, the other caveat when you respond to it, they'll, if, they, if they don't deem you capable of doing it, they're not gonna send it to you. But if you ask for it, they will send it to you. And so that's one of the reasons why we've added this, this uh, acquisition decision link and an email for the contracting POC to make sure that you're on their list to get it if they're not going to post it to um, the portal of whatever contract vehicle that they're they're using. Um, yeah, so that's that's one of the biggest hints that we can tell you about so you don't miss an opportunity that you're waiting for to come out. Um, and then the, the last part, I, I always throw this in here because we always get asked, 
hey, I'm an 8A company. I'm looking for 8A direct awards. What, what do you have for me? And our office actually doesn't get a list of the 8A sole source requirements that, that we're having, uh, that we're gonna execute. Um, we see them after that decision has been made. So if you are an 8A company and you're looking for those direct awards, um, you should be targeting our program managers that have those requirements. They're the ones that do that market research. They're the ones that make the assessment, oh yeah, the 8A program would be a great way to go. And here are companies that can do it. And then they make the recommendation to the contracting officer, say, hey, you know, we have this requirement, it meets the thresholds, we want to do it 8A, we want to do it direct. Here are the companies that we've talked to, here's the pros and cons of which ones can do it, and here's my recommendation of the one that we pick. And then the contracting officer reviews all of it and makes a decision that they're qualified, capable, and then it comes to our office. And what we're looking for in our office to concur on the decision is, are they, they day, most importantly. Um, it is, we, we often get folks, yeah, yeah, we know what the 8A program is, um, but then they're not actually in it or they graduated. Um, so we make sure that they're viable. Um, the other thing that our office does is ensure that we're spreading that wealth around, that we're not over-targeting one or two 8As and giving them all the work, instead looking to make sure that, um, and that we are, are spreading out those opportunities that we have. All right, some more hints. Um, if you are a company that's innovative, and that you're looking at new solutions, we have the authority to do other transaction agreements, which are non-FAR based agreements. We generally look are looking at uh, solutions and prototypes to see if they're gonna work. And then, you know, if, if they do move them into production. Um, and so if you're interested in that, you can go to this, uh, this website and a couple of things that are kind of interesting about the, the website, one, and I just looked yesterday, we don't have any current OTA call, calls for white papers at the moment, but you can sign up to be notified when we post something new. And then we also keep on that, there's a, a link you can, a button you can click that takes you to all the ones that we've done in the past. So you can see the kind of innovative prototype requirements that, that we looked at, and then how we also ask for all of it. I, I think it's if this is what you do, it really gives you an insight on how we do this piece of it and the kinds of things we're looking at, the kinds of things we're asking for um, and to go forward. So if that's what you do, um, take a look at that, that, um, that dreamport.tech portal. The next one is about technical exchange meetings. So if you're a company that has a new product that you've developed or a, a new service type um, thing that you want to demonstrate to the Department of Defense and to DISA specifically to see, hey, we think we have a solution that you need, or we have this thing that really is going to save you time, money, or make you more secure, then this is where you can request, we call them TEMS, Technical Exchange Meetings, and you go in and register who, who you are, what you want to do, and all that kind of stuff, and then um, someone at DISA will set up a time. One of the one of the good things that it has come out of um, uh, the COVID situation is that we took this from an in-person, go somewhere in Northern Virginia and demonstrate to a closed group of people to going all online. And so one thing it's been able to do is we've been able to clear out the backlog before you were waiting six months or more to demonstrate your product. Now we can set those up based on your schedule and what's available within weeks. The other good or bad point, depending upon on your, your uh, perspective of it is that this goes out to not only the DISA folks, but it goes out to anybody that's on that list. And that can include the NSA folks, the Cybercom folks, and also industry. And if you sign up on their list, even if you don't want to demonstrate or after you have demonstrated, they send that out an email like twice a month saying, okay, here are all the upcoming technical exchanges that we're doing through it. And then you can sit on them and, and, and look at it. So other people, not just DISA, can have access to what you're demonstrating and going, oh, we do need that. Um, and so you can get potential um, interest, not only from DISA or NSA or, or Cybercom, but industry as well. So that's an option that's available. 
We talked about doing your homework. We have fact sheets on the majority of our programs. So if you're going, oh, I don't, I need more information about this, or I think I know what this means, or I don't know what this means, you can click on that on our website and it, it has, I don't know, there's 30 or 40 of them. The other thing at the bottom of it, if you look down, um, we have these things called lookbooks. Um, some are newer and some are a little bit older, but that they target different programs throughout DISA and they do this quarterly magazine that includes the programs that we execute, but also the people that are in charge of them. So if you're a person that likes the faces with everything or connecting a program and a name and a face, uh, those are available to you as well. Um, but definitely check the date of them because the older ones probably aren't up to date with our new mission titles of our centers, but that's there for you. Um, back on our webpage, uh, we have a, you know, how do I get a contract? And that's just some process stuff. Um, one of the things that, you know, we meet with contractors every day and, you know, been doing this long enough that you, you meet people over and over again. And this is even back to my days at other agencies where you meet the contractors. So I'm going to tell you the number one secret on getting a contract um, because we get asked that all the time. And I meet with companies that I've met with before and they're like, hey, Carlin, great to see you. Hey, we're doing everything that you've told us to do and we still don't have a contract. We're, we're doing our homework, we're doing our research, we're responding to sources, sought notices, um, we're meeting with any PM, any contracting person that will meet with us and we still don't have a contract. I'm like, oh, okay. And then my first question is, well, on the last contract that you proposed on, what did the contracting officer tell you was the reason that you didn't win the contract? And every single time, I swear to God, every single time they go, oh, Carlin, we haven't gotten there yet. To which I say, okay, if you haven't proposed on a contract, why would you think you're going to win a contract? And, you know, it, it's, it's one of those disconnects that you know you got the folks working really hard knowing what they want but you have to take all the steps including proposing on it so anyway you know that's not any big insight to folks um probably listening to this but you know that's you know what, what we see often um one thing to know also when you're looking at different agencies is, is what are those barriers to entry um, I've told you about one of our barriers to entry already, which is you have to have the contract vehicles that we execute on, which only come up at certain times for submitting the proposals to win those contracts or getting on those GWACs or schedules with the exception of GSA Mass. So if you don't have any contract vehicle, but you want to work with us, that is one that you should target. They have ongoing open enrollment on that one um, all the time. And it has gotten significantly easier to get a contract over the years. It used to be much more uh, painful to get, get on those vehicles and, and the pain wasn't necessary. So they've, they've really done some good things to streamline that um, and make it easier, especially for small business to get on them. But a second barrier, and probably the biggest barrier to entry that we see at DISA is our facility site clearance. That 95% of our requirements will require at least a secret clearance. And we generally don't sponsor clearances. So we get asked that every day as well. And I've been at DISA for six years and I've seen two contract vehicles um, that would sponsor the clearance. And that was the SETI and the Encore contract vehicles because they are 10 years, because they are multiple award and that there is low risk in the timing because you have 10 years to get the clearance. But also if someone can't get a clearance, the risk is negligible when you have 20 contractors on each suite. Um, but those are the only ones that I've seen that we've done that. So if you don't have a clearance, the next question always is, well, how do I get a clearance? Um, the fastest way to get a clearance, not through a prime contract, is as a subcontractor. If you can work with a company, small or large, that has a contract that requires a clearance, and they bring you under as a subcontractor, they can sponsor you for the clearance. 
And, you know, I know it's not ideal. Um, I know it, the whole clearance thing is the chicken and the egg. I can't get the contract without the clearance, but I can't get the clearance without the contract. Um, but what I would recommend, if you don't have it and you're just looking at that process, the, the DCSA website, the agency that executes the clearance process, their website is really good providing you the information on both the company clearances and the personal security clearances. Um, so that's, if you don't know anything about it, that's your starting point um, going forward. Um, and, and they actually are pretty good at working with small businesses on answering your questions, um, of which the answer to, will they sponsor you is also, they don't sponsor. Um, and then on the subcontracting opportunities, I told you I'd have the link directly to that. Um, and, and here it is. This, this will take you directly to our directories for the SETI and the Encore. Within this, uh, those are the biggest opportunities to look for subcontracting opportunities, kind of like the broad brush level. And that, but every requirement that we have um, that goes full and open, that's awarded to a large business, we'll have subcontracting requirements attached to them, whether it's at the instant procurement level or back at whatever contract vehicle it was. Um, and on our larger ones, uh, we've written into the contracts that the monitoring part of it, the reporting part of it, not only goes to the contracting officer, but comes to our office so we can see what they're doing and what they're not doing. Um, and then also work with them to encourage them to do more. So for, for instance, we just had a business matchmaking session last Monday and every study and encore large business contractor was invited to participate and they almost all did. And so they came and they are too looking for, for this uh, potential uh, new, new small business subcontractors. Then the number one question that our office gets asked is, how do we meet with your program managers? That is important to know what our requirements are, what our pain points are, what's going well with the requirement, what's not going well, what the future of it is. And so we actually have um, uh, a group in DISA that that's their job. They're called Corporate Connections. And this is the website or the link to um, how to request a meeting with, with industry. And so our corporate connections folks work with both large and small businesses, and they have a form if you want to have, if you want to meet with someone and it's a, a form that's way too long, but nonetheless, um, it's their form and they ask you all, all the normal stuff, who you are, what you do. Um, but then they ask you who you want to meet with. So if you know who you want to meet with, real easy, put the person's name in there. Now, on the other hand, if you know the person you want to meet with and have their contact information, you're free to go ask them directly. But if you don't know who you want to meet with and you know what program area, but you don't have a name or you don't have contact information, fill all of that out in there. Um, and then they ask you, you know, basically why, who's going to meet with them. But more importantly, why whoever you're wanting to meet with should meet with you, you know, the what's in it for them kind of a thing. And when I ask our corporate connections, I'm like, how successful are you in getting appointments scheduled for the folks asking for them? And they said, well, about 50%. I'm like, okay, that's actually not too bad. Um, but they said that the, if you look at the, the hints from below, that's kind of what they gave to us to say, these are the ones that tend to be more successful. The ones that know generally who they want to meet with, maybe not the name of the person, but they know this is the requirement, this is the section, this is who, who owns it, um, are more successful, but also answering the question of, of why. Um, another hint that if you asked to meet with a director, your chances of getting a meeting are slim. Now I will tell you, our current director is very engagement. Um, he's very pro engagement with both small and large business. So he actually does meet with small businesses. Um, but I will tell you when I get invited to those meetings and sit in on there and every single time when I've left that, I've asked the small business, I'm like, well, how do you think that went? And like, oh, it was fantastic. I'm like, so what did, what was your takeaway from that meeting? What did you get out of that meeting? And then it's like, nothing. 
I'm like, right, because you didn't ask him for anything. Um, but a hint, and I know this sounds silly, but our director is actually not a decision maker when it comes to who does our contracts. So meeting with him, unless you have an earth shattering, money saving, time saving, um, new requirement that you can't get traction on, your time is better really targeted at the people that can say yes to you. So anyway, and that's my, my soapbox on that. Um, but again, we have a whole, a whole section in our, in our agency that their job is to help you connect with who you would like to connect with. All right. So now just a little bit, looks like we have about 10 or 15 minutes left. So who my office is. So we are an office of four, the four folks on there, you'll see myself, Brenda Leonard, our associate director, Gina Pasqualucci and Jessica Bath and Logston, our small business professionals. Right now we are full-time teleworking. Um, we are not in the office, but we now have cameras, which makes it really easy to actually meet with you. But when you send a message into DISA, small business at mail.mil, one of the four of us is who's going to answer your email. Okay. So just to finish this up before we get into any more questions, our FY21 small business goals and achievements are listed here. Um, most importantly, I think for your takeaway is what are the dollars that we're spending in each of our categories? Uh, DISA is a very uh, small business friendly organization. We have a small business first policy, which says that every requirement that comes into DISA is automatically set aside for small business unless and until market research bears that small bit, that two or more small businesses cannot do it. And I think that that framework versus a, you have to fight to get something set aside has been a real key to our success. And not only that, our procurement people and our program people understand this program and support it. Um, and so you can see that last year um, we did set three records. We had the highest percentage of our small disadvantaged goal, our women owned goal, and our hub zone goal. And we're really proud of that hub zone goal. That was something that we really pushed for a number of years back and got it rolling to find all those great hub zone contractors that can execute our work. So now we not only met our 1.5 small business goal, but we strove to hit the federal and DOD goal 3% and last year we exceeded it. Uh, we didn't quite make our, our small business number, or SDVOSB goal number, although we were close in both of those. And so those are our focus areas going into FY22, um, which um, the next slide, I'll show you what our FY22 goals are in a second. But this is just one to kind of show that we are a small business friendly organization. And that over the last 10 years, our, our average uh, small business percentage is over 28% with almost $16 billion worth of direct prime contracts to small business that, that we've executed. And then finally, our, um, our goals for this year, you'll notice two changes. One is the small business goal. We dropped from 28 to 25%. Um, and that is being driven by a lot of missions DISA has been directed to take on that will be fully full and open where that will count against our denominators. Uh, we talked about the, the fourth estate network optimi optimization the, where we became the executive agent for uh, the IT for the, the, um, the fourth estate, those 26 defense agencies. That is all, all those dollars are, are already determined large business. We're bringing on a cloud component, the replacement of the JEDI, it's called JWCC. Uh, we will not award those contracts. They are all full and open to large businesses and those dollars will count against us. So that's what's driving the small business. Our goal here at DISA is regardless of the percentage to strive to execute more dollars to small business. So that's, that's what we're, we're looking at. And then the other one is the small disadvantaged business. We went from 5% to the 14.22%. And while that's a staggering jump in it, um, we executed over 13% last year. So it's more and we'll still push for it, but 
it is uh, probably attainable for us based on what we've historically executed. Now, those of you who are familiar with Executive Order 13985, um, Advancing Equity um, in Procurement, um, that's where this is coming from, the, the current administration's push to ensure that our small disadvantaged businesses are having uh, more opportunities within federal contracting. And so they've pushed this number as we will too. Uh, the hard part about that goal is that we don't have a federally designated category that allows us to specifically target uh, the SDBs um, outside of the 8A program. So you may see us doing more 8A competitive work and more 8A sole sources to try to meet this target and also the intent of the executive order. All right. And then I just want to tell you about, I told you at the beginning about this uh, director's engagement with industry. And um, we are, it is line of effort three that we're on. Um, if you want to sign up, they do two different things. So May 16th is the time to sign up. They have 20 folks, the first 20 people that sign up for it, get a seat in the room. And when I mean that, that you'll be able to, you'll be live, like, You'll, you'll have the ability to be on camera and ask a question. Um, everybody else will be on a Teams live streaming event where you get to watch the event and see everything and you can type in questions, but they won't target you. Um, his whole point, he wants real questions to be asked to them by real industry. So if that's something you're interested in, you wanna be able to ask a question uh, at 8 a.m. on May 16th, sign up. Otherwise, you can sign up at any time, no cost, um, to get a link to be able to view the session where he brings in his subject matter experts to talk, in this case, line of effort three, uh, leveraging data as a center of gravity. And I will end my talking with the final, if you need anything from us, that's the best way to contact us, uh, either the email or the phone number. Thank you, Colin. That was great. Uh, very informative. We only have time for a couple of questions. So we have some in the chat box. First one is, is there a recommended approach for sole source with DISA? Is there a specific process? Um, and this person is asking related to SDVOSB. Okay, so with the SDVOSB, there is an authority to sole source, but that's caveated with you can only, you have to be the only SDVOSB that can do that work. So we do have the authority, but unless you are the only SDVOSB that can do that work, then we can't sole source it to you and we would do it competitively. And in my four years in this job, we've had one hub zone. Uh, requirement that we were able to determine there was only one hub zone that could do that work and we did sole source that, but we haven't found that for the women owned or the SDVOSB um, categories to date. Okay, thanks. And the next question is, I noticed that the DISA forecast no longer lists anticipated set aside status. Can this information be added back to the spreadsheet? I did not notice that they took that out. It's not, they don't have the an anticipated acquisition in there anymore. Um, hmm. I can ask that question. I don't, I'm not in charge of that. And honestly, I was just looking at the new one and I, I didn't notice that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I will ask that question. And then if you want to follow up with me on this, uh, small business at mail.mail, I will let you know what I find out. Okay, thank you so much, Carlin. Um, and that's all we have time for. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And as Carlin said, if you have further questions, you can email her on there, um, which I on the slides there, I'll be sending them out to you shortly. And the replay will be available later today. So thanks again to our guest speaker, Carlin. And thank you all for participating. And we'll see you on a future PTAC webinar. Thanks, everyone.